I'm George Knapp in tonight for the vacationing Ian Punnett. Time now to get to our main guest for the evening. His name is Brent Miller. He's a, a techno guy. He's got more than 30 U.S. patents for advancements in human interface recognition software, artificial intelligence applications, data transmission protocols, and a lot of other stuff I probably can't understand. He has a lifelong dedication, he says, to something he founded called the Horizon Project, put together a research team with scientists and other researchers looking at um, some of the great mysteries and challenges facing our world. And uh, like a lot of other people, Brent has uh, sort of had some bad vibes about what might be coming. Brent, you there? Uh, Yes, I am. It's a pleasure to be on the show with you, George. Great to have you here. Let's just start with this. I know you've been on the program before, and some of the listeners may be familiar with you, but let's just get a general thumbnail sketch. Project Horizon Project, what is it? How does it work? And most importantly, why should we believe you about your predictions, what's coming in the future? Um, Well, the Horizon Project, uh, you you summarized it very, very concisely. Uh, We're a team of scientists and researchers with contributors in pretty much every major scientific field around the world. Uh, Why should you believe the information we're collecting? Uh, Most of the information we're collecting is being made publicly available, and it is publicly accessible by most people. These are not opinions of one person, a dozen, or even a hundred, but the top leading scientists in many of these fields. So you you gather information and analyze it as opposed to, you know, going out and digging stuff up on your own. Correct. I mean, the scientists actually go out and dig up stuff, and we do more than just uh, sit back and collect the information and analyze it. We actually have scientists fly to us. We go to them. We just came back from the Middle East with uh, an entire film and production crew, uh, looking at some ancient documentation, about 4,000 documents where some of the oldest predictions in the world are for what's about to happen uh, exist. Um, so we do not sit back and, you know, come up with theories. Um, in fact, that was the reason why the Horizon Project was uh, built in the first place. It's, it was literally built and designed to solve some of the world's most puzzling anomalies or questions. But Have you solved any? Well, we believe we have solved one and it's an absolute, um, it, it's a scary one. Which one? Uh, well, based on the years of research, we have undergone to conclude that from the physical evidence, historical documentation, and the scientific evidence, what we now know, cutting-edge technology, cutting-edge science, that Earth's history and our inevitable future is not what we've been commonly taught. Um, let me give you an example. Most of okay. us have been taught that Earth changes are extremely slow and occur over millions of years. Um, an example, the best example I can think of of mass population being informed of this is the forming of the seven continents. Uh, we're taught that they broke apart from a single large continent to the respective positions today, right, and it took millions of years. However, the actual physical evidence shows that this is not the case at all, that the continents actually broke apart and moved to their respective positions in just a few short years, no more than a maximum of a couple hundred years not the millions of years that scientists say. Okay, what is the evidence for that? Well, the, the, the periods between these global upheavals, massive instantaneous global upheavals, um, are very, very slow and occur over thousands and millions of years. But between these upheavals, you have the slow geology, and that is where the original theories came from because that's what the scientists see because they're not around when these massive upheavals happen, and new scientific evidence, when we actually study the ocean floors, in this particular example, when we actually go down and study the ocean floors, we see the ocean floors do not replicate a a millions of years theory, but an instantaneous theory. For example, if the Atlantic Ridge is separating Europe from the United States, which it is, the two continents, um, a few centimeters per year, then computing the distance back, saying that they were one continent one time, you could easily surmise how many millions of years ago these two continents matched up like a puzzle. That's that's the theory. That's where they came up with the original estimate. However, if if Europe and the United States, or sorry, uh, America, are separating, then the Pacific Ocean is shrinking, conversely, and it is older, whereas the newer Atlantic Ridge would be newer mass, Newer plant, new, newer animal life, newer decayed animals on the ocean floor there, and newer sediments. 
So when you look at the sediment substrate on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean and you compare it to the, quote, theoretically older settlements by millions of years of the substrates on the Pacific Ocean, you should see a vast difference in age. We don't. In fact, they're almost identical. I'd be real interested in seeing that evidence, uh, Brent, because I'm sure that there are a lot of geologists out there who are screaming um, into their radios right now saying that that you've got to be wrong. Let let me ask you this, just to be clear on this. Are you saying that the process that separated the continents itself was quicker or that or we are incorrect about how long ago it happened or both? Um, It was an instantaneous event for the most part. It wasn't a slow migration of continents away from each other. A sudden catastrophic global effect altered the Earth's north and south poles, essentially a geographic pole shift. This created a new centrifugal force uh, geometry on the planet, which caused new, the, the, basically the continent to break up and to reorient themselves in a matter of just a couple hundred years to their current positions. And then once they got close to their current positions, which would only take a couple hundred years, then the slow process started moving over the last few tens of thousands of years of the continents, repositioning precisely in these that, where they're at today. I guess the question is what caused the pole shift, but that's going to sort of be the topic of tonight because you're saying another pole shift is coming, right? uh, uh, The evidence suggests that uh, the sudden physical pole shifts having dramatic cataclysmic results pretty much decimate most of the life on the Earth. And each time this occurs, they occur very quickly and quickly meaning within a few days. Um, And the, the evidence, as you just mentioned, does indicate that we are on the doorsteps of the next shift. Uh, It could happen tomorrow. It could happen 50 years from now. But all the evidence that we've been able to collect indicates the next one is about to happen. We'll get into that in a second. I wanted to uh, ask you in general about the the stuff we talked about at the beginning of the program, how gloom and doom predictions, prophecies, the Mayan calendar, Nostradamus, all this stuff, we keep hearing so much of it right now. And I wonder if, uh, if uh, how you look at all of these things, whether it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy to, to hear this stuff over and over again, or all these psychics, all these other folks uh, were on to something. Well, it, it, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I kind of chuckle when you ask that because I didn't hear the first uh, hour of your program. Right. And we're going to get into quite a, quite a bit of that uh, in, in this program here. But one thing, the, these uh, ancient prophecies and modern prophecies – uh, talk about, they talk about, they come from different cultures, different countries, different languages, different uh, eras of mankind, even on different planets. And they all point to the same thing, and they're all saying approximately the same thing, pointing to this particular moment in time, this part of human history. They're all saying the same thing. They're not saying a hundred different things. They're all saying the same thing. And they don't know each other, and they're in different countries, different languages, scattered over the last 3,000 years. When you see that, you have to sit up and take notice, because why would they all be saying the same thing? And Brent what Miller, they're saying uh, is starting to come true. Brent, I'm going to have to take a short break. We'll be right back with uh, the Horizon Project's Brent Miller on Coast to Coast AM. Stay with us. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. My name is George Knapp, and for Ian Punnett tonight, I'm talking with Brent Miller of the Horizon Project, uh, which is looking at uh, combining scientific research and prophecy, things of that sort, to look into the human future and the, uh, the future of this planet. Brent, uh, let me ask you this. How much of what uh, your predictions are based on is it comes from science, and how much of it is based on or inspired by what we would call prophecy? Uh, actually, 100% of what we have been working on for the last five to six years is based on science. In fact, we have completely exhausted to the point where we are so confident that this event is going to happen. We have actually turned our attention to prophecy. And what we find out, not actually that surprising to us, is that prophecy is matching the science that we have uncovered. So what we have actually uncovered is science, and that was our entire forte but we have delved and will continue to delve into the prophecy because the prophecy seems to not only augment the science, but it, has, it is actually talking about events that are occurring today that science could never know. Well, you know, you mentioned about the, and I mentioned it as well, uh, that uh, about 
the Mayan prophecies, for example, the calendar ending in 2012 and everyone assuming that means the world's going to come to an end then. I mean, realistically, how do the Mayans know? They're they're not a, a real advanced technological society. They're living in the jungle, Central America. How is it that they tap into this knowledge of the future thousands of years? We actually don't know how they got that knowledge. Uh, we do know that their mathematics was actually beyond the mathematics that we have today. Granted, they don't have computers. They can't compute, couldn't compute things quickly. But their mathematics, for instance, in their calendar systems, their calendar systems as it existed back then are far more accurate and precise than our calendar systems are today. Um, where they got that knowledge, we don't know. In fact, they, it was only determined just in the last few years that their, quote, ending date for the era is not really an ending date. It's the ending date of a large cycle, which then starts a new, what they refer to as a new era, um, a new age. Um, it ends on December 21st, 2012, but its ending date corresponds to the closest place that the Earth and our solar system approaches the middle of the galactic plane. And that was only confirmed by our astrophysicists within the last few years using computer models. So how they were able to determine this a couple thousand years ago is, is honestly beyond, you know, our ability to understand. Unless well, let's jump into this now. This. This uh, middle of the galactic plane stuff, that's sort of right at the heart of, uh, of your predictions for bad things to come, right? Well, it's already started. Uh, the galactic plane is a dense gravitational field. The closer you get to the center of it, the more dense the field becomes, and as you pass through it, it becomes less dense. It, it's not a, uh, a paper-thin line in space. It is actually a a spiraling plane that all these stars in our Milky Way galaxy revolve around. And our solar system, with its star, the sun, moves psychically up and down it on a period of, uh, uh, every half period is 11,500 years. Uh, so we're approaching that half period point in just the next few years. But it takes, because of the thickness of the plane and the thickness of our solar system, it takes about 20 years to pass through. We're already about halfway through. It started in 1998 when the Earth started to feel the effects of the pressure wave or gravitational wave exerting from the galactic plane exerting on the solar system. And that the very first effect we saw is the Chandler wobble of the Earth, which was a very, very stable wobble for hundreds of years, suddenly stopped. And now, it has, since then, it has been acting erratic. Um, the next thing we saw is that in the year of a solar minimum, the sun went on a massive rampage, more X-class flares than we've ever seen before. In fact, a couple of the flares were, were beyond what the satellites could measure, and it took out two of the satellites. So they've actually had to redefine the X-class scale. They have, they're guesstimating. They don't know what the most intense flare was because it went off the scale, but they're guesstimating anywhere between an X-28 and an X-43. So just to summarize, you're saying that uh, the changes that are occurring to our planet are the result of our solar system passing through the middle of the galactic plane, right? Right. We reached the closest spot on December 21st, 2012. But that, I, I, yeah. I would think that that would be really hard to calculate. I mean, if you, to, you know, for one thing, as you said, the, the galactic plane is not a line like on the football field or something. It's got to be enormous. And, and, and determining where it is exactly would be pretty tricky since we don't exactly know what the outer edges and, and uh, diameter of, of our solar system are. Or, or have you guys figured that out? Um, the, uh, we don't know where the, or the gal galaxy, not the solar system. I'm we, sorry. Oh, the, uh, the solar system we, we have pretty, pretty well mapped right. out, but right. how the, um, how the Mayans did it, we have no clue. We, we can't even comprehend how they could have had such knowledge, but the astrophysicists today do know, have mapped out that we will approach within three degrees of the center of the galactic plane on that date and then start veering away from it. So we, as a solar system, um, uh, have the greatest gravitational force. Do well, that's so. what I was going to ask you. What is different about the spot where we are in the in the galaxy? What is the physical difference that would affect our planet if we are, our our uh, solar system moves to a different part of the galaxy? Oh, it sounds it sounds like the question is what is the galactic plane? Yeah. I, I I really totally skipped over that. I apologize. Um, the astrophysicists 
in the last few years have concluded that every active galaxy um, has a what they refer to, for lack of a better word, a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. Now, as black holes get larger, they spin faster. And even though small black holes are absolutely solid-packed, uh, dense neutrons, as they spin faster and faster because they get more massive, the inside of the larger black holes start to become more hollow. So that larger black holes are 90%, 90% of all the mass is in a shell, like an eggshell. As you increase the black hole even further, or these black holes get larger, the tops and the bottoms open up because you're spinning incredibly fast. They do not know what causes the spin rate to reach a maximum velocity. The faster, the larger it is, the faster it spins. So that when you get to a, a black hole that's four trillion miles across at the center of our galaxy, the top and the bottom have opened up to the point where it's a flat ribbon. It is actually not a sphere. It's a flat ribbon spinning 4,000 miles across, and it looks like a ribbon. Um, the gravitational wave that emanates from that black hole forms the equivalent of like a LP record, a disk, that spins in conjunction with the black hole. So the, the gravitational wave radiates from, radiates from there in a flat plane, and it moves in a circle around the black hole. Now, all the stars in the galaxy, the spiral arms of the galaxy, are attracted to the gravitational wave. They do not, they, they have recently concluded that galaxies are formed by A, it's the chicken and the egg scenario. A, the black hole comes first. Then the stars form. They don't know how, but the stars form and psychically move up and down the gravitational plane of the black hole and then around it. Our solar system is one of those stars, and we are moving in a rhythmatic cycle above and below that plane. And this rhythmatic cycle is the cycle that the Mayans computed when we go through the plane, when we come out of the plane. I mean, did they ever actually write that down, the Mayans yes, said? Absolutely, yes, they did. In fact, they referred to it as the dark rift. And they also referred to what scientists would say are attributes of moving into a black hole. In other words, Einstein computed that if you move to a black hole, time and space would be distorted and there would be some sort of dimensional rift. In fact, one of the Mayan legends indicates that when the four corners of the earth, referring to this time coming up, when the four corners of the earth sits on the dark rift, and, they, and we still call it the same thing that the Mayans did, the dark rift, then a cosmic sky portal will be opened up and, quote, holes will be harvested, whatever that means. But it, it seems to imply um, a dimensional rift, which implies a tremendous gravitational uh, force equivalent to that would be generated from a black hole. Did you say souls would be harvested? Yes. Yes. That, that, that's what the Mayans wrote, and, and you, you see some merit in that prediction? Um, our, sci our science is based on uh, science and physical evidence. Um, and what we do see is that the science backs up the fact that the, gra that the gravitational wave from the center of the galaxy... Uh, is spinning and causing the stars to revolve up and down cyclically through it and around the galaxy. The astrophysicists today are now uh, have uniformly basically realized and have stated that in the center of every galaxy is an active black hole, a supermassive black hole. Ten years ago, the concept was ludicrous. They yeah. never even knew a black hole even existed in the center of a galaxy, never mind what we're describing now. The, the, the quantum physicists say that the gravitational wave, if such a black hole exists, even this far away from the center of the galaxy if you, would be the equivalent of you actually passing through the black hole itself. In other words, you're bending time and space. And this is the type of concept these sorts of uh, predictions would be, um, I, I guess, written down by ancient prophecies. But okay. the evidence we have, what I want to present, uh, first and foremost, is all the science and what okay. has happened in the past. Then we can get into the prophecy. All right. Well, we'll do that when we come back after this break. We're talking with Brent Miller of the Horizon Project. Stay with us on Coast to Coast AM. Thanks for being with us here tonight, everyone. Uh, a lot of fear and trepidation in the world as we uh, hear various predictions for doom and gloom, end of the world stuff. Our guest is Brent Miller of the Horizon Project, and we're going to ask him, what role does remote viewing play in the uh, development of some of these dark predictions we hear about 
the end of the world and doom and gloom, predictions that seem to be everywhere these days. Brent believes there is going to be a pole shift, that it will have dramatic effects on our planet, on our physical environment. When we come back, we're going to get into that on uh, what we might be facing. Stay with us on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back, everyone. I'm George Knapp in tonight for Ian Punnett. Our guest is Brent Miller, founder of the Horizon Project, which has put together a team of scientists and technologists and, and others to predict what might be coming in the future for us. Uh, Brent, before we get into pole shifts and why that's going to occur and what it might mean, I want to ask you about remote viewing because if someone had told me that, um, that that this is a technique that that you folks rely on to some degree. Tell me, uh, do you rely on it? If so, how much? Uh, what kind of a role does it play in developing the predictions that you make? Well, actually, we not only don't rely on remote viewing, we don't use it at all. Okay. Um, that are strictly based on, you know, uh, geologists, physicists, uh, astrophysicists, uh, linguistics experts, and, um, uh, you, you know, studying physical evidence around the planet. You know a guy named Ed Dames? Uh, yes. Uh, Is he? We, we do know that uh, Major Dames, yeah, he, I do know him personally, and he's a friend. Um, and he came out of the military. He was a training and operations officer, incredibly well-decorated intelligence officer. And I know he's been on your show many, many times. Yeah, I haven't I haven't interviewed him, but he's been on the show a lot of times. He's made a lot of really wild predictions, and uh, quite a few of them ha- haven't come close to coming true. Yeah, I do know that with regard to the upcoming event that uh, we are seeing from a scientific standpoint, he as a remote viewer, and I believe a number of his remote viewing team members indicated that they saw a passing space body. Uh, a heavenly spa- uh, space body moving between the Earth and the Sun preceding this event um, of, of a shift. Well, he didn't actually call it a shift, I don't believe he might have, but preceding this event. A space and, body meaning an asteroid, a black no, hole? No, 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 planet size, a planet size, a okay. very, very large one, which would trigger, according to him, a very large uh, uh, solar flare from the Sun. In fact, we see, from a scientific standpoint, we know that this... Uh, is most likely the planet Jupiter, because coincidentally, every 24,000 years, the planet Jupiter, uh, not Jupiter, I'm sorry, Venus, aligns on the southern ecliptic of the sun with Earth every uh, 24 to 26,000 years. And that alignment occurs in June 2012, just before we hit the midpoint of, uh, of the solar system reaching the galactic center. Well, I, you know, I know that Ed Dames is well-known, and a lot of people uh, put a lot of stock in what he says, but I also know he's been on this program, has made a lot of, of very elaborate, specific kinds of predictions that have simply not come true. So, I, again, I guess, um, you know, grain of salt. Okay, yeah, we, don't, we do not use any remote viewing. Okay. Are you a remote viewer as well? I was actually trained by Ed himself about 15 years ago when he was in Beverly Hills. And it is an amazing tool, but we don't use it because it doesn't give us the detail or the vast amount of incredibly detailed information we need in all the various disciplines of study we need. We yes. rely on the top-notch scientists literally on the planet, uh, going to them and them coming to us in order to uh, cross-reference the data to, to make sure that we don't miss anything. Well, let me, I don't want to belabor this point, but I mean, I know that's what you're relying on, uh, you know, scientific evidence for the stuff that's on your website, the predictions you're making. Have you, as a remote viewer, looked at this scenario yourself? Uh, no, I haven't. We, we do not use it at all. Uh, you, you haven't been curious to, since you've been trained at this. Wouldn't you want to try to use the technique the, the and see what you infor- see? The amount of information you get from remote viewing is extremely small compared to the raw scientific data that you can acquire with physical evidence. Okay, let's talk about pole shift. What is it? What's going to happen? How bad will it be? Okay. Um, well, when, when I say pole shift, I mean a physical pole shift. The, the Earth spins on its axis, and we have a, the top and the bottom of the axis. We call the north and south geographic poles. And then we, we also have a geographic equator, um, as if it were a top uh, that was spinning in space. Uh, when a pole shift occurs... Uh, instead of the, the Earth spinning on its normal axis, it starts to wobble suddenly, and this is usually caused by an outside influence. 
as if, they were at, as if it was off balance. And then it equalizes into a new spinning position. Anyone who played with a top, they know if they touch the top while it's moving, it wobbles instantly and reorient itself. Um, and that is what we refer to as the pole shift. But when it reorients itself, the physical locations for the north and south poles have moved. The Earth is now spinning on a different imaginary axis. Now, that may not seem all that bad, but what happens is this. The Earth, while it spins, has centripetal force, uh, centrifugal force that actually pushes out the diameter, the geographic diameter of the planet at the equator approximately 42 kilometers wider than the distance between the North and South Pole. So if you move the physical poles, that pushing out of where the old equator used to be will suddenly fall back down because the, the centrifugal force is not there, and the new equator will be pushed out. Basically what happens is the continents reshape themselves almost immediately to compensate for the new equator being pushed out. Now, 42 kilometers is about 26 miles. Uh, so you have about 13 miles on each side of the planet that is pushed out. Land mass is pushed out at the geographic equator. That is more, a greater distance than the highest mountains on the planet. So during this time, as the, and since the planet is covered by 70% water, during this sloshing about, uh, as the Earth wob wobbles and reorients, itself to equalize the external pressure, what happens is the oceans literally decimate all the coastal areas around the planet. And in addition to that, continents will actually sink beneath the ocean and other continents will rise up. Um, so it is actually incredibly devastating. Uh, we have evidence that this has happened at many times in the past, at least three separate times in the past. Um, uh, when? When was one of, that? One of the things you would see, well, the last time it happened, the evidence shows that it happened at approximately 9,050 B.C. We, uh, what you would see, this isn't the entire Earth being vulcanized, for example. It's the pole shifting. So you have entire continents not being torn apart but dropping into the ocean, which means if they have cities on them, those complete intact cities, call it New York City in the, in the future, just simply drops into the ocean. So future civilizations, a few thousand years later, can look at the bottom of the ocean and see the remnants of the city. That's what we see all over the planet today. We see cities off the coast of Cyprus, Japan, India, Cuba. We see them at the bottom of Lake Fuxian in China. They essentially, they cover the globe. And these cities are not just minor debris. Um, they're major metropolitan areas, massive rock structures in these ancient cities, which have temples, pillars, pyramids streets, etc. So these didn't just, they weren't, obviously they weren't constructed at the bottom of the ocean, and the land they rested on is intact. They just simply dropped to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and in addition, when the pole shift reoriented the equator, new land masses, which were at the bottom of the equator, suddenly move with the new centripetal force pushing the land mass out, move to the, day, you know, the light of day. An example of that is just west of Las Vegas, at the top of the mountains, we have Coral Head, which is approximately 11,500 years, dating the same, the carbon dating to 9,000 B.C. Um, so the area of Nevada in the vicinity of Las Vegas, at a minimum, was at the bottom of the ocean oh, yeah. about 11, 12,000 years ago. Well, there are uh, there are also archaeological records, paleontological records here that show humans lived here eleven thousand years ago. So I don't know. Yeah, um, so there's 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 we don't know how much of the land mass has moved up and down. Right. Um, and the, obviously, the closer to the equator, the more it moves up. The further away, it doesn't have as much force, so it's going to stay where it's at. Well, you are right that this uh, the most of Nevada and the Great Basin was covered by water a long time ago. I, I'm, you know, what occurred to me as you were uh, saying that Brent was uh, about ninety five hundred years ago. I wonder if that's related to the Atlantis legends. Well, you know what? Every uh, we, when we started studying prophecy, when we started collecting the document, collecting the documents is the first part. Going through ten thousand documents is the hard part. It requires an incredible staff of people collecting it and consolidating it into categories. The first thing we notice is that almost every ancient culture 
on the planet, regardless of what language, what century they lived in, almost every ancient culture has legends of high technology, A, that they that once existed before them. They, they talk about a civilization that was before them that had high technology, and B, that that civilization was wiped out by some sort of water-based event. So can we assume that anything uh, coastal areas, coastal cities, coastal residents need to be worried about this? I would think that about 25% of the world's population right now lives within 50 to 80 miles from a coast. And that represents basically 2 billion people would probably die within a matter of a day or two uh, when the event happens. Floods. Um, then exactly and what and what what happens after that's not the end of it i wish i could say that was it um and within a matter of months probably another third of the planet would die due to lack of food clean water and medical supplies because this kind of decimation you can't send out the red cross i mean there's no there, there's no roads there's no infrastructure there's no um there's no communications there's no technology the power grid is gone and so basically you've been thrown into the dark ages. And in high-tech societies like the United States, Europe, we would suffer the most. We're used to going to grocery stores and getting food. The so-called third world countries wouldn't suffer as dramatically because they're already used to poverty and fending for themselves and growing their own crops. Um, so even though it would be serious for them, they would continue to grow and thrive where it would be more difficult for us. Um, and when food runs out, I and mean, that's still not the end of the story, now we're talking two-thirds of the population, when food runs out, um, now you have people turning on each other. Um, I'm not, what I found out about six months ago was the food supply that we have for the residents of a country usually is depleted in three days. If something should happen catastrophic to this nation, for instance, the po a massive power grid failure, the whole grid goes down. Three days later, the entire food supply for the country would be gone because transportation would come to a halt. You can't drive the trucks to deliver food. All the shelves in the supermarkets would be gone in three days. What do you do when there's no more food? You and get a gun and go grab some, probably. That's, that's what a lot of people would do. That's exactly the type of society I think we have. And then I, I heard during the break a commercial uh, which was interesting, uh, getting people to take um, some sort of chip. See, at that point, people would gladly take a chip under the right circumstances. They would line up because tremendous poverty and hunger is a, is a great motivating, equalizing force. doesn't matter whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or a ditch digger. You need food and you need medical supplies. So if your job, if you can get that freely from the government by just taking a chip, to, quote, track you to make sure that you don't get more than your fair share, it seems plausible. I think most people would line up and say, give me the chip and give me my food. Um, so I think there are scenarios which could actually lead to those type of predictions. What other kinds of uh, effects, planetary effects, environmental effects? I, I had seen predictions about these huge winds, hundreds of miles an hour winds, things of that sort that would happen. Um, Actually, you're right. Along with shifting of the pole, that is what would happen as well. But those would be short-term. A lot of dust would go up in the air, and the, the result and aftermath of the dust would cool the planet, and we would end up having a mini ice age. Um, we see, if you look back at the ice core samples for the past 600,000 years, you see that approximately every 110,000 years there is a uh, a tremendous increase in CO2 po uh, concentration in the atmosphere, and almost immediately after that, an ice age. Um, and we would be at the forefront of another ice age when that happened. Um, but in, in terms of what, other, what else happens to the planet, uh, much of the sea life would die uh, because they can't live in murky waters. As we p pass through the galactic plane, uh, supp supposing the event was caused the pole shift was caused by the external influence of the galactic plane. As we pass through it, there is a lot of debris that is sitting on the galactic plane, on that gravitational field that does not move psychically up and down. It has lost its kinetic energy. It's just sitting there. We're talking massive asteroids, planet-sized asteroids, in fact, in some cases, 
and they're just sitting there, and our solar system is racing toward that, that plane. In fact, if you look at the computer simulated models of our galaxy, and we look at the Hubble telescope, looks at other galaxies, you can see this dark line where we call this line the, the edge of the galaxy, and the Mayans call it the dark rift. And it's dark because the light from the stars can't get through it because it has a lot of debris sitting there. So as the solar system moves through this debris, they are going, the asteroids in the debris will be plunging through our solar system, hitting the Earth. So we would expect to be hit by a number of asteroids, large asteroids and small asteroids. Yeah, so people in coastal cities, coastal communities, they got to be worried. Where do you live? Um, I live about 90 miles from the coast, about 700 feet up near a mountain. <laughs> so you're, uh, uh, in, you're in at fact, least taking... Let, let, let me tell you how serious the science is. When, when you look at the data, at first they're in denial. But there is so much overwhelming evidence that the scientists themselves, they come to their own conclusions, and they come to the conclusion that, yes, when you look at this data, and it's beyond overwhelming, they have to take this seriously. And one scientist went home to his wife, and they had built their dream house after 40 years on the Atlantic coast, on the East Coast. And, I mean, massive, beautiful dream house. And the wife said to him, okay, so if this is really true and this is going to happen and this is the data, what are we going to do? And he just looks up at her and says, you're right. And within a year, they moved. They moved to Kentucky. They abandoned their dream house because they feel it's coming back quickly. Um, and most of the scientists we deal with, they... Uh, they see the evidence. A lot are in denial. I would be in denial, but I'm more of an engineer um, and scientist. I have to look at the data, and it's overwhelming. So tell me this. I, other than the scientists who are part of your group, the researchers who've looked at this and talked about it, have you taken the information elsewhere? It sounds like you have. And we have if so, it. where? We, we, have, we collect the information literally from all over the planet. Um, we, have, we have scientists that are experts in ancient technology, geologists, physicists, uh, quantum physicists, well, general physics, underwater cities who study that, ancient civilizations. And there are a number of people who actually study past cataclysm, cataclysms and even map out where the past few poles uh, were based on um, physical evidence scattered around the planet. Um, what we are doing is we're collecting and compiling all the information as it comes in. We believe that we will be finished this year with our compilation. And this will include not only the scientific work, but the prophecy work. And then we're going to release it all uh, before the end of this year. But, I mean, have you, for example, said, uh, hey, knocked on the door of the U.S. government and said, look, you guys got to get on this thing? Or do you, do you believe they already know? Um, I believe that every, every high-tech government on this planet knows exactly what's going on. In fact, if you knew what was going on, you would take, in, in, just in my humble opinion, you would take one of two stances. Um, you would either let things go, let, th let things go, let the economy go, let everything go to pieces, because why? Why bother trying to build it up in a few years? It's already going to be destroyed. Or you try to do something that will set you so yourself up so that your country can have some sort of edge after the effect. For instance, Norway, you, you, I'm sure yeah. you heard that they built a seed bank. Well, yeah, they we're gonna... that like an emergency measure, and why? We're going to talk about that uh, when we come back. We'll take a short break. We'll be back with Brent Miller of the Horizon Project here on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, at the beginning of the program, you might remember I mentioned something about the doomsday vault that's being built uh, by the Norwegian government. Uh, they're putting uh, copies of uh, or examples, samples of all the different kinds of seeds from all the plants all over the planet, putting them into this vault in a remote area, an island off the coast of uh, Norway, deep into this mountain, sort of a living Fort Knox of plant life on the planet Earth. And we, I, I speculated then, I wonder if somebody knows something we don't. My guest, Brent Miller of the Horizon Project, uh, started to hint about this before our break. Brent, are you there? Um, um, yeah, I, in, under normal circumstances, this seems like it would be a very logical thing to do, to protect the seed, three million seeds on Earth. But the speed and the necessity for which they felt they had to build this vault, and particularly the location, um, they chose it above the Arctic Circle, and they also dug into solid rock about 600 feet above ocean level, above sea level. Now, if there's a 
a pole shift, the waters won't rise that high being that far north. The poles would actually have to shift quite a bit, uh, perhaps even 90 degrees before it even would approach that. Uh, the odds of that particular mountain with the worst-case scenario pole shift actually going under the waters are practically nil. But the speed at which they built it, they started this project in uh, 2007, they completed it in 2008, and now they are asking for all the world's countries in order to populate the vault with seeds immediately. Um, And, you know, they're trying to protect it from what? Um, The only thing on that rock are polar bears from our understanding. And it would be a difficult, if not impossible, place to check in and out seeds as you need them. So it is a truly uh, doomsday type of vault. But why build it so quickly? So they, they must know something. And would you think that our government would be part of that, that we're a, a partner in it, or are we allowing the uh, Norwegians to corner the market on seeds? They actually, well, the way they did it, it's interesting. They got the U- U.N.'s permission to do this. The U.N. is is part of this, actually. And then they announced to the world that all the countries of the world can put their seeds in the vault, and they they are encouraging it, and that the country is able to withdraw the seeds out of their vault at any time they desire. However, if we have this event, uh, the countries won't be able to readily have access to this vault, of course. Um, But uh, it it does make you think that because of the speed at which they did this and the place at which they built this vault. Uh, it makes you think there's something more to it, that they do know something. Uh, uh, a lot of the governments around the world are starting to do things that don't really make political or economic sense. But it would in light of what we do believe is coming up in the future. Well, you mentioned this example and you mentioned the failure to fix our economic problems. Are there other examples of things that governments are doing that don't make sense that would fit into this scenario? Well, there's, there's a number of subtle things that are being hinted to. For instance, uh, we've all heard of the one world order. If we have a worldwide collapse, we already have to have in place pretty much a single unified structure to have a single government, a single political system, single currency. A economic collapse would pretty much guarantee a single currency because somebody would, all the countries would have to consolidate somehow. Um, uh, let me see. Um, Brown, uh, three or four months ago, indicated that all the countries in the world must band together in order to fo- solve this financial crisis. Who is so this? I, Who said this? Brown? Uh, this is Prime Minister Brown in yeah, okay. uh, England. Gordon and Brown. He, uh, he said that um, if all the countries in the world band together, we might be able to resolve this. Otherwise, there's no hope. It's going to be a global collapse. And the, the, the very concept of a global economic collapse was unheard of a year ago. Nobody would, they would have thought you were crazy if you even said global economy. Now we're saying global economic collapse and we see it happening everywhere. You let's talk about, let's talk about some other possible precursor events. I mean, are there things, physical things that are happening on our planet that you would say is an indication that this is coming? Something that, that precedes the, uh, the pole shift that you're talking about. And let me ask, I'll, I'll ask it a different way. The Yellowstone quakes, you know, they've had more than 900 of these mini quakes. Now, maybe this is unrelated. You tell me. Is it somehow related? Uh, actually, I do believe it's related. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the precursor events, uh, the, the precursor events will be subtle compared to the massive pole shift, which will basically wipe out 4 billion people within six months and then a Mad Max scenario. But the, so these, quote, subtle events... I'm calling them subtle with respect to the major event, but the events themselves have tremendous significance when you look at all of them being combined. As the solar system, including the Earth, moves closer to the galactic plane, it is going to be um, feel the effects of the gravitational pull of this plane more and more. So it will affect not only the Earth, it will affect the rest of the planets in the solar system, it will affect the sun. It's not just Earth-centric. It affects the whole solar system. So we see that the planet's temperatures of, of the inner five planets have all risen a slight bit, including the Earth. We see that the sun is starting to go on a rampage. We see that the gravitational effects, this external gravitational effects on the Earth, we would um, project and predict that the, even though the uh, Earthquake and tectonic activity 
would not occur, continue to occur in the same stable places where they were around the planet. They would tend to move. In other words, earthquakes would occur in diverse places. In other words, places where they normally don't occur for thousands of years, we're starting to see more of those. In fact, people build populations on non-earthquake areas, except in California. Um, <laughs> um, but now that these earthquakes are happening in places all over the world where earthquakes normally would never be expected to occur, many, many people are dying. Last year alone, over 88,000 people died due to earthquakes. In fact, the number of earthquakes that have occurred in populated areas has increased six to ten times in the last ten years. Um, so the frequency and intensity of earthquakes that are killing people is going through the roof. Because those earthquakes are occurring in populated areas where they didn't occur before, to see a graph of this, so you can see in real time what this graph looks like over the last 100 years, you can see that at the news section at thehorizonproject.com. But getting to Yellowstone, Yellowstone is a situation that all the scientists and geologists are praying will not occur. As you said, there is a tremendous amount of seismic activity underneath Yellowstone right now. And Yellowstone is unique because the magma underneath Yellowstone ha releases a gas. Um, and the magma is coming toward the surface and the gas is becoming released with greater intensity each day. The problem is the magma coming up compresses the gr gas and creates a very explosive high pressure situation under Yellowstone, similar to what we saw at Mount St. Helens years ago. However, this is much more vast and we're dealing with molten lava. So they're just praying that this settles down and goes away, which it could. But these type of things we would expect to see as, as, as one of the things because the earth is being affected externally. Uh, Brent Miller, I'm going to have to take another short break. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, climate change, extreme weather, things of that sort, whether that is also related to this. Stay with us on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. We're talking with Brent Miller of the Horizon Project about uh, possible changes to our planet coming, some of them very severe, according to some predictions. We were just talking a moment ago uh, about Yellowstone, Brent, and, you know, I can, I, you know, maybe it's related, maybe it's not. You would agree that the tectonic things, the uh, volcanic things, the earthquake things going on at, uh, around Yellowstone could be completely unrelated to this. I mean, there are a variety of reasons why that's happened, happening there. It's been around for a long time in that area. Right? That's correct. It could be completely unrelated. Um, but when you take a look at not just Yellowstone, but when you take a look at hundreds of other anomalies around the world that are happening, and in the solar system, you see that there's something definitely going on. Um, so, uh, what about weather? What about weather? weather extreme weather, one. I mean. Yeah. Extreme weather. Uh, let, let, let's back up just a couple of years uh, talking about weather. Um, in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2006, the National Climate Data Center released their 2006 report showing the significant and extreme weather anomalies around the world, and they indicated that never before has there been so many droughts, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, and in places where they normally do not occur ever in the history of their reporting. Now, that's in 2006. Guess what? The very next year, they then report that 2007 was the weirdest weather year on record as these disasters continue to increase. So, in other words, 2007 topped even 2006 report. Let me give you a few examples of, of the oddities and the frequency in the last few years, and then I'd like to uh, cap it with a report from Oxfam uh, in London. Uh, we had uh, first snowfall in Baghdad in over 100 years. Tornadoes in Cairo and uh, London. In 2007, we had records on the number of tornadoes hit in New York City, Iran, and Omen. Tornadoes doubled in 2008 and prior years. Afghanistan suffered the worst weather in 30 years. More than a million homeless and flooding in China last year. The worst snowstorms in 50 years slams China, and millions are marooned. Um, New Zealand volcanoes erupt without warning um, following some cyclones. Um, it, uh, 1.8 million people are evacuated as a typhoon pounds China, and heat waves kill people from Tennessee and across Europe. This is last year. And now this is the latest Ox Oxfam London study report. Let me, if you don't mind, let me read just a couple sentences here. And okay. You'll see what we're talking about in terms of weather. London reports that natu natural disasters have quadrupled in the last 20 years, with flooding worldwide increased sixfold. 
The planet is now experiencing about 500 natural disasters per year compared to the last 100-year norm of 120 per year. This Oxfam study was compiled using data from the Red Cross, the United Nations, and specialist researchers at Lovon University in Belgium. And I'd like to quote this one phrase from the report. This, this summarizes it all. Quote, this is not a freak year, referring to 2008 and now. It follows a pattern of more frequent, more erratic, more unpredictable, and more extreme weather events that are affecting more people, unquote. You know, the, and the they whole, don't see an end. The whole topic of climate change is politically charged, supercharged. If you mention the term global warming, you got half the people want to <laughs> cut, your, cut your throat or something. Um, you know, I remember you mentioned snow in Baghdad the first time in 100 years. We had a big snow here in uh, in December in the Las Vegas Valley. Snowed on. It's not unprecedented, but it's very unusual. And people would write in to say, aha, here's proof that there's no global warming because it's cold here. But it did seem to strike me that there's something odd going on with the weather, whether it's global warming or global cooling or I guess it's manifesting itself in different places in different ways. It, it's a little erratic, and a lot of Earth's weather is also connected directly with the sun. And what you would expect, whatever affects as our solar system gets closer, the, the sun is nothing but a star. It will be affected by this plane as well. And anything that affects the sun is going to have replications on the world's weather. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example of what ha- what's happening with the sun. Um, uh, 2003 was the end of the solar minimum, you, you know, the 11-year solar cycle. The right. next solar maximum, as we know, is going to be in 2012. Well, during the year of the solar minimum, uh, 2003, the sun literally went on, and the NSA reports, and I quote, a rampage. And it had more X-class flares during a solar minimum than any time they had in recorded history. I, I mentioned briefly a couple of the X-class flare numbers. Uh, they are afraid of what's going to happen. If that was a minimum, they're afraid is what's going to happen when 2012 comes along, which is the solar minimum, which just coincidentally happens to reside at the time that we're saying that we should be nearest the center of this uh, galactic uh, plane. Okay, now, well, what? tell me, what could happen? How bad does well, that get? Let me tell you how bad. NSA just released a report, the NSA being the National Academy of Sciences. They released a report two days ago, and they were referencing a power grid breakdown, the largest major solar storm that had ever existed in the history of, that, of recording, happened in 1859. And it caused telegraph wires to short out in the United States and Europe. From that, that little bit of information, they were able to surmise the energy project what type of event is about to happen. And the report is actually incredibly scary. Um, they indicated that as a result of the solar minimum years, a remarkable rampage occurred with 10 major solar flares, and it knocked out two Earth-orbiting satellites and crippling an instrument aboard the Mars orbiter. Um, they are indicating that this 2012 event, if, I mean, it's an if, they have no way of knowing, if The same type of storm occurs in 2012 that occurred in 1859 during the solar maximum, and they expect it to be more intense because of what just happened a few years ago, that it has the potential of knocking out the power grid in the United States and all around the world. And let me me quote, the power grids are so interconnected that a big storm, the type expected to occur about once a century, could cause a cascade of failures that would sweep across the United States cutting power to 130 million people or more in less than a few minutes. Such widespread power outages, it goes on. It basically, by the end of the report, the entire country has just been thrown in the dark ages, and it could take up to six months to bring it up. That alone, if the shift never even happened, that alone could cause the type of pandemic uh, we were talking about with uh, foods being depleted from the stores in three days. Okay, you mentioned this is a National Academy of Sciences report. Can you give us the title of that thing? This is the National Academy of Sciences. In fact, when the report came out, Fox News reported it uh, just two days ago, Friday, January 9th. Uh, The reporter was uh, Mr. Britt, Robert Roy Britt. Uh, What's the the title of this thing? And I'm asking so if people want to look for it online, they Uh, can find it. Powerful uh, powerful solar storm could shut down U.S. for months. 
Okay. And that, uh, okay, can they find that on your website? Uh, no, but I can have it put up there tomorrow. Okay, that's a good idea. Right. Uh, as I recall, uh, it, I remember reading this, and I'm, I'm not sure we have enough time to answer, but we'll get started on it before our next break. Uh, you were going to make an expedition to the North Pole to sort of check out some evidence regarding p- potential pole shifts. Did you do that? Uh, we actually had that scheduled for last August. Uh, that expedition was being led by Dr. Brooks Agnew. Some of the funding fell through, and it was rescheduled for next August 16th. So it is still in place. It's going to be about eight months from now. Okay. So and what are you going to look for? We're, we're looking for about uh, the, the funding is, is quite expensive because we need an atomic ice cutter, and there are only two available in the world for rent, uh, private rent. Um, and so that that's the problem. Um, an what, atomic ice cutter? We do need an atomic ice cutter to get to where we need to go. And uh, it's, it's quite expensive. You have to rent the, the ice cutter, and, of course, that comes with the crew and everything else. Uh, the first, it was put off initially because our own Department of Transportation insisted that we could not board a foreign vessel of that nature with um, potentially classified high technology, the type of instruments that the universities are building in order to put on board in order to measure the magnetic flux that we need to measure. The, the expedition is a purely scientific expedition in order to look at uh, the anomalies as the magnetic fields of the Earth uh, basically focus onto the gravitational, basically focus into a single spot. Uh, th- these type of instruments have not existed before, and we need to go to the source because we can't create this type of field in nature. Man can create electromagnetic fields, incredibly intense electromagnetic fields, but they cannot create, we can't create purely magnetic fields. And this is what we need to go to. This is why the expedition. And uh, a number of universities and scientists from all around the world are invited and going, uh, and they all have their own individual reasons and what their universities are sending them for. Uh, My purpose is simply to measure flux variations and deviations to see how the magnetic field of the Earth is being affected by uh, anything external, get any evidence whether it's, it's stable and not moving or whether it's moving. We do know it wanders. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for very subtle uh, micro changes. Well, see, I'm not technical enough to know how you detect flux variations, but maybe you can tell us about that when we come back. We're talking with Brent Miller of the Horizon Project. we got a lot more to cover. Stay with us on Coast to Coast AM. Well, we're talking about some pretty grim scenarios, uh, polar shifts, uh, solar flares, cataclysms on an unimaginable scale, billions of people dead, Not sure any of us are going to want to be around to see it, assuming it comes true. I guess the point would be, and we'll ask this of Brent Miller, the founder of the Horizon Project, uh, what's the point? What's the point of even talking about it? If if it's all going to be that bad and we can't do anything about it, we can't stop our planet from passing through the galactic plane, why even get into it? Uh, We'll get into that question and more when we come back on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back, everyone. I'm George Knappian. Tonight for Ian Punnett, our guest is Brent Miller of the Horizon Project. We're talking about some pretty grim stuff uh, that Brent and others believe is coming our way, changes to our planet, things that we can't control. Brent, you heard my tease uh, during that break. What's the point? Yeah, I I heard that tease. I was wondering if you were going to ask that, being an investigative reporter. (laughs) Um, it, it, it is not our intent to cause fear or panic, even though it does. Um, but by releasing the information as soon as we're able, we, we want to give people the ability to prepare. These things are going to happen. People's lives are going to fall apart, and we, we want them to know what's happening. Uh, let, let me give you a quick scenario. Let's suppose somebody has cancer. Uh, you tell me what is better. Would you rather have cancer, not know, not be told, not be able to treat it, um, and not be able to look for yourself as to what is important in your life? Or would you rather be diagnosed, know what's happening so you can prepare, and most importantly, define for yourself what's truly important in your life? I mean, we hope that, you know, this will be a wake-up call for people. Um, we want them to look around at what's happening in the world. Find out for themselves the information. It is available. We will do everything we can to make it available to people. Uh, we want them to find out what's truly important for their life. Um, what has real and lasting meaning and what would be considered a waste of time. We believe this will help people live more fulfilling lives and prepare for this event. 
I remember uh, there was this old song by Frank Zappa years ago. He had a song about uh, moving to Montana soon, going to be a dental floss tycoon. Uh, should we all move to Montana? <laughs> I don't know if there, I don't. We haven't really looked at the geometries of the Earth, and you know what? There is no way we can predict uh, where the pole shift is going to be. And so, without knowing where it's going to be, we don't know where, honestly, would be the safe places would be from a scientific viewpoint. For example, underneath the Arctic, uh, Antarctica is a massive 600 million square miles of tropical forest sunk to the bottom of the ocean and frozen. That didn't happen over thousands of years. Otherwise, there would be no evidence of the forest. But it's a frozen, massive tropical forest. That resulted, that, that was many pole shifts back, and that was a massive pole shift. So if that type of shift occurs, the entire continent could disappear and be somewhere else. So we have no way of knowing what's going to be safe and what's not. So we need to prepare. In fact, I, I just want to indicate, because this really does sound like science fiction, I want to give people a real sense of how delicate this planet is. Our Earth is really fragile. It spins um, weightless in space, frictionless almost, in space on its axis as it travels around the sun. So it's, it's basically this free-floating ball. Any external influence on it will be enough to cause it to wobble. Einstein himself addressed this issue when he said the Earth is so fragile that all you needed to do was melt the polar ice cap to a significant amount and the Earth would shift, have a, have a geographic pole shift, and decimate the planet. Um, also, to show you how delicate the planet is, none of us were alive, and we do not have serious recorded history that gives us details about the last catastrophic pole shift, but we do have details about how fragile the planet is. In 705 B.C., a gra we assume, you, know, you, you can follow the assumption why we assume this later, we assume a gravitational body not the galactic plane, the gravi a gravitational body, maybe a massive uh, planet, black hole, who knows what it was, past the planet in 705 B.C. Here's the result. Uh, it caused the planet literally to stop revolving in its current direction. Stop revolving. Go backward for approximately what we would consider 10 hours. Then it resumed its normal rotational spin. Our computer model shows what type of, what range of gravitational forces, how they must have approached the planet and how they must have left the planet um, proximity as they passed by in the direction opposite to the rotational spin of the planet in order for that effect to happen. This is recorded by many, many civilizations on that date, and yet it's not taught in schools is how delicate the planet is. Well, um, hold on a second now. It, it's recorded that the... That the planets, uh, it, it changed directions? It, it's, it's, it's recorded not. by, by uh, whom? By, by what civilization? Uh, there were 15 major civilizations at that time. It's 705 B.C. Um, it was recorded in King Hezekiah's day as the sun moved up, backward up the sun palace steps by 10 steps before resuming its normal direction. Oh. At the very same time, the Chi Chinese, as you know, were tremendous ancient astronomers. They record on that very same day... From one third of the way on the other, one third of the way from the planet of the Middle East, they recorded the event as the sun sat in the west, rose back up again from the west, almost to the high noon position, and then resumed its normal path. It's the day they refer to as the sunset twice in one day. Now, this is the final effect. That effect before that day, the the 15 major civilizations on earth they all had calendars and they were all astronomers and they had very accurate calendars and all their calendars were based on 360 day years uh, these calendars were the the major um, civilizations at that time were the assyrians the chaldeans the egyptians the hebrews the persians greeks uh, phoenicians chinese mayans and hindus and there's there's three others that i can barely pronounce so i won't even try <laughs> that's but, okay um, what happened is after that date the Earth now took three, turned on its axis 365 revolutions in its path around the sun to meet one solar year. It took only two years before all of these civilizations realized and were able to properly compute the new uh, speed around the sun and the spin rate in order to readjust the 15 standard calendars at that time. Uh, Numis um, 
Pompilius. He was the second king of Rome at the time. He reorganized their calendar of 360 days by adding five days per year. King Hezekiah, Numa's contemporary, reorganized the Jewish calendar by adding a month each Jewish leap year, and others made different adjustments. But this is a what I would refer to as a modern-day event. That was less than 3,000 years ago to show us how delicate our planet is. So By the we, way, I should I should yeah. go, I'm sorry. I, I should mention you were talking a little bit ago about this uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, report that uh, was talking about solar flares and the possibility of its effects. That has already been posted on the Coast to Coast website. It was posted a couple of days ago, uh, uh, J- January 9th, I believe. Uh, if people want to check it out and take a look at it. And I'm sorry for interrupting you. Oh, that, that's quite all right. Yeah, that's the date that they they came out with the report on Friday. But, yeah, that just uh, – it so so these a very small gravitational force like that could affect the planet. Whatever Whatever caused it, it was temporary and it was flying by the planet, which only pulled it a little bit and then released it. And then the planet went on its merry way. But if the solar system would pass through a a fixed gravitational wave, you can see that the devastation would be far greater. So what we're talking about coming up in the immediate future is far greater than what we have documented by 15 different civilizations less than 3,000 years ago. Uh, Brent, you were talking about, uh, in response to one of my questions, you said you really don't have any kind of projections on places that are going to be safe. You do know which places will be unsafe, and that's the coastal areas you talked about. And and, and uh, as part of that, this question I'm asking, somebody has to know. I mean, we mentioned about the seed vault that's being created in a, in a place that um, obviously somebody has figured is going to be safe. Well, they've mapped out very accurately the last three pole shifts. And the last three pole shifts um, only changed by about 30 degrees each. So if you project maximum worst-case scenario, because the worst-case scenario is where the new equator sits. It's not where the pole sits. It's where the new equator sits because the new equator defines, with respect to the old equator, which land masses drop into the ocean and which land masses rise from the ocean. So if you want the safest place on Earth, where do you go? You go as close to the North Pole as you can because if it shifts only 30 degrees, no matter where it shifts, you're still far away from the new equator. That's why I believe the Norwegians planted the doomsday vault uh, above the Arctic Circle on a rocky island 600 feet, and they, they drilled into solid rock 600 feet in the air, I mean above sea level. Um, those type of places are rare and far between, and I'm not about to, you know, live in northern <laughs> northern Canada. So what, first, um, you're not. I mean, even though you are pretty much convinced this is going to happen, I would. I the all the evidence shows it. Uh, for, first of all, you said the subtle signs. The Chandler wobble stopped. It stopped at the same time the sun went on a massive solar flare. Uh, a few years after that. Um, and that subtle signs, and that happened in 1998. And the Chandler wobble has been a very, very consistent wobble every year for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the moment we start to move through the galactic plane, it stops, and now it's acting erratic. We have dangerous sunspot uh, solar flares that occur during a solar minimum. The abnormal weather patterns are getting worse. The um, the earthquakes are occurring in more diverse places, killing more people. These are the subtle signs. But if you look at these subtle signs, and they're all happening at the same time. And when I say, for, for example, um, we have 500 natural disasters a year that should not be occurring. Um, and this just happened in the last two to three years. So we are definitely heading towards something not good. Uh, All the evidence does show it's pointing to. And then on top of all the physical evidence and scientific evidence and the cyclic evidence, we have prophecy that for some reason it all seems to mesh with what what we believe scientifically is going to happen. Oh, and and with regard to your last question, it it does make kind of sense because we don't try, as scientists, we don't try to make uh, add or our interpretation to what, Things are said that we cannot prove or disprove. We, we don't say that certain legends meant this. We just take them for what they said. So when you said, well, what does this mean? The Mayans could have simply said, you know, when this event happens, the harvesting of souls, it could simply have meant that many people will die. And, of course, they would in this event. So I would stay away from the coast. Um, and uh, this, There are ways to prepare that you've been talking about, but there's no way to prevent it. 
Uh, is that what you're saying? No, there's no way to prevent it. We'd have to change the course of the solar system, as and this it's been very consistent for you know ever ever since the solar system formed. You know, it just cyclically moves up and down the uh, the galactic plane, and this event happens over and over again. We can see this psychic event very clearly solidified in, uh, uh, I don't know how many pole shifts back it would have been, but we can clearly see it solidified at least 600,000 years by looking at the Antarctic and Greenland ice core samples, which measure year to year the temperature in the CO2 atmospheric concentration that's locked in the ice core sample during those years. Um, this cyclic pattern is extremely repeatable uh, over would, the last 600,000 years. I, I wonder if, as things get closer, it, it, let's say we're a couple of days away from it really hitting the fan, does somebody, would you predict that somebody comes forward, the president makes an announcement, uh, hey, everybody, get ready, um, you know, do what you can to get ready for it, but it's coming. Well, I actually don't believe there would be warning. I think we are given all the warning we're going to be given. We're seeing all the signs. We know, um, we, we know scientifically that if there is this galactic plane, as the ancients tell us, it, at, at the new uh, quantum physicists tell us today would be the effects. And the astrophysicists tell us that if the center of our galaxy is a black hole, supermassive black hole and spinning, this would be a wave sitting there. Um, the astronomers tell us we're heading toward it. There's, there's no turning back. All the sciences are merging together to say that there's, no, there's going to be basically no warning. It, it, it's simply like the day in uh, 705 B.C. where the Earth stopped and shifted direction and released and went in its normal direction again. There was no warning for that. In this particular case, there won't be any warning as, as well, I don't believe. It was One of the- very quickly. Yeah. One of the criticisms I've seen of, of the uh, Horizon Project, and, you know, of course you're going to have uh, people who are going to criticize you and, and dispute uh, your findings. One of the things I saw online uh, in preparing for the program was something written about uh, Dr. Brooks Agnew, who is listed on your website as one of your, your scientific advisors. I think he's uh, a physicist, and, and they uh, criticize him for being a believer in the hollow earth theory. What do you say of that? Well, like I said, each of the each of the universities and scientists that we deal with, they have their own pet reasons for going to the North Pole. I do believe that that is one of his reasons. We don't we don't have any scientific evidence whatsoever, um, and I don't believe he has either. But um, I can't speak for him. Uh, his reason and some of the people who are backing him in this expedition want to check out certain anomalies that he doesn't that he keeps to himself while at the North Pole on this expedition. But we are coming on this expedition for our own reasons and our own intent. But the scientists that we deal with are the top notch scientists around the planet and we do have not advisors. He is not an advisor. He does provide information along with many geophysicists, linguistics, uh, geologists, uh, astrophysicists. So he is just one of at least 150 uh, scientists. You must get an awful lot of grief from others. Uh, in terms of, well, people are in denial. They don't. They want to think the world continues the way it does. For example, the scenario of 705 BC. It is so well clearly documented. Anybody who really wants to look at it can. Um, and the information that we have is presented by NASA. It's presented by quantum physicists around the world. The thing that we do that nobody else does is we pull it all together. The way science is structured today, everybody specializes. In fact, the specialization is too specific so that since they, there's no incentive to cross-correlate information from, say, astrophysics to geology to genetics to quantum physics um, or any ancient technology lost or um, microchondria DNA um, because there's no incentive to have all of these different groups of scientists talk to each other because they can't talk to each other anyway because they speak different languages and they don't know what piece of information they have that may solve a puzzle in another field. They don't. That's where we have created this years ago, and we go and gather the information to, to assist in solving these problems, and they work with us in order to you know, reconcile the differences as the information from other fields is brought to their attention. 
So you, you mentioned 150 scientists. I, I didn't see 150 names on your site. Are there a lot of these guys who don't want their names associated with it, well, or the, would prefer the the, okay. the vast majority of people we associate with? We we provide a list. We have I think we provide a list of references that some of these have written. Uh, if you look on the notes page, I think it's over uh, 50 50 different names. Um, I think that's all we provide on our on our site. Uh, the, the three people that you see, their physical pictures, their physical pictures are there because we have little clips from the interview in the first DVD that we've sent out. I see. That's the so, only reason their picture was there. Otherwise, their, you know, their picture wouldn't be there at all. So what do you want people to do? You, obviously, one thing you want them to do is go to your website and take a look at this stuff. Well, what we're, what we're doing is we, will, we are finishing up prophecy. We have several thousand more documents. Like I said, we, we just went to the Middle East where literally there's over 14,000 different documents and fragments of documents prophesying what's coming up. Uh, combining that with the other prophecies around the world and different cultures, within the next few months we will have compiled this and we'll have a final report, and I'd love to be able to come and share that with you. Okay, well, count on it. Brent uh, Brent Miller of the Horizon Project, very interesting discussion. When we come back, we're going to open up the phones and hear what questions our listeners have for you. Stay with us, everyone, on Coast to Coast AM.